Hello and welcome once again to this Red Gaming Tech video with myself and Marta where as always I'm here with the latest news from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we're going to start things off with a little something from Kingston. So according to an announcement from Kingston they have actually reached the very top spot as the top DRAM module supply in the world according to the latest rankings of DRAM Exchange. And according to Trendforce of which DRAM Exchange is a part of or a divisional to be more used more accurate term, Kingston have a very, very impressive 72.17% market share. So unsurprisingly, this leaves Kingston at the top of the marketplace, and this is the 16th year that Kingston has held the throne. And I even have a little bit of a statement here from Mike Moni, um, Monhi, sorry, excuse me, the DRAM business manager for Kingston. While Kingston considers Trendsforce estimates overly generous, it nonetheless follows the trajectory of the company's growth in all of its business segments. In 2018, we're able to produce over 14 trillion megabytes of memory across all product lines, including DRAM, SSDs, and embedded solutions. This massive amount, tremendous good fortune, and findings from Trendforce reinforces our company's strength, position, and importance as a whole in the industry. So let's move swiftly on from that piece of news over to a couple of things from AMD, the first of which is they have updated their roadmaps. So, there's a few things we can learn from each slide that they have released here. For example, we can see that RDNA 2, the 7NM Plus design, is still being worked on. It's shown as in design here. And looks like it's not going to move past that phase for some time, as of course there is nothing past the chart which ends at 20 21. But we can learn a fair bit more from the compute architecture roadmap which they've released. So we can see that Zen 3, the follow up to Zen 2, which of course is Ryzen 3000, it's going to be based on 7 and M plus, and it's saying design complete, and they are already working on Zen 4. So this basically means that they have moved on from the Zen 3 design phase and are actually working on developing products that implement this new architecture, which again is going to be 7NM+. And for those of you wondering what Zen 3 is actually going to be facing against in terms of competition from Intel, it is going to be the response from AMD to things like Comet Lake S or even Ice Lake X. That is, of course, if Ice Lake shows itself before Computex 2020. So none of this is world-ending, world-shattering news, but it is interesting nonetheless that we have an updated roadmap and we now know that, for example, Zen 4 is already in design and Zen 3 has finished that particular phase. So, that's not the only AMD thing I have for you today, my friends. Next up, we have a CompuBench listing again for Navi 14. So before I actually dive into what we can learn here, this is all thanks to, again, Komachi on Twitter, whose name you should be very familiar with by this point. So again, we can learn quite a bit about this particular GPU. For the graphics, we don't have a huge amount here. We only have the tessellation load te level test having been completed. And you can see in the off-screen off and on-screen results for that there. We have much more results when it comes to the compute section. Every um, benchmark that was actually able to be run, there's a couple that weren't supported. The end body simulation, for example, were not supported. Every benchmark that could be run was run. So we have quite a bit of information here. To put these results in a little bit more sort of helpful context, you can see on screen I've compared it against the RX 580, and you can see it is either falling just behind or just ahead in some cases on certain tests, at least on the compute one that I've got on screen here. But if we compare it against, say, the RX 570, you can see it is... In the few tests that is available on the comparison, it does fall behind in all those available benchmarks. So this pretty much matches up with the benchmark that we saw previously. We are kind of expecting 570, 580 level performance from Navi 14. But again, this is just one set of benchmarks, so do not take that as set in stone. But still, more benchmarks are always good. So we're going to move on from that particular topic now to one that I have discussed a lot, and that is loot boxes. Now this is a topic, again, that I've talked about many, many times, and lately it's been more talk about whether or not they're seen as gambling, legally speaking. You guys, if you're familiar with the channel at all, probably know my opinion that I believe that loot boxes are a form of gambling. Now, 
they have been banned in certain places, for example, like Belgium, but the UK Gambling Commission has previously ruled that loot boxes cannot be regulated as gaming because there's basically no mechanic to turn what you get in-game into actual real-world currency. But now there is a report from the UK Parliament's Digital Culture Media and Support Committee, or DCMS, to put it a bit more succinctly, basically saying that this is, quote, arguably out of step with the digital econo economies excuse me, in the games industry, since while they might not have real-world monetary value, and this is that quote, they do have other types of value. And numerous people, including myself, have said that it would be better that we, if we could just purchase these skins or whatever they might happen to be, just directly. And the DCMS also raises a very, very valid point that has been raised by myself and pretty much every gamer on the planet that's raised an opinion against loot boxes at this point. Yes, most games do not let you sell whatever items it may be, skin, whatever, for real-world cash in-game. But as we've seen with several games, like, say, Counter-Strike, there are outside third-party systems that you very much can turn what you get in-game into some serious cash. Or potentially serious cash. I mean, I'm not, I'm not getting into that whole can of worms, but regardless, the potential there, my point is to turn it into real-world money. So... The DCMS also went on to say that, quote, academics broadly acknowledge there is not yet enough evidence to reliably conclude that loot boxes cause problems with gambling. But they did concede that basically problem gamblers will show similar characteristics and behaviour with loot box mechanics. And unsurprisingly, that particular behaviour is more prevalent amongst young adults, so teenagers and so on and so forth. And what I find actually quite hilarious is that they've even commented on the statements made by EA recently. Now, obviously, they got themselves in a lot of hot water with their response to the whole Star Wars Battlefront 2 thing. You know, it's all about a sense of pride and accomplishment and all that. And they seemingly can't help themselves because they recently said that loot boxes are quote-unquote surprise mechanics and also called FIFA's Ultimate Team Packs quite ethical and fun. And the DCMS have quite rightly, I might add, called them out on this behaviour. And they said, This is noticeably out of step with the attitude of many gamers who contacted us following our evidence session, including those who vehemently rejected it characteristics of packs not as loot boxes, but as surprise mechanics. So, what is the TLDI here, I hear you ask? What are the DCMS actually recommending? Well, they're basically saying that there should be go um, government regulations put in place, uh, specifically under the 6th section, 6th and section 6 of the Gambling Act, during the next parliamentary session to confirm that, quote, loot boxes are a game of chance. And they believe that if they choose not to do this, they should give a concrete reason as to why they do not see loot boxes as gambling. And they are also further arguing that loot boxes should not be sold to children and that Peggy ratings for games w should be labelled as such. Apologies for my phone going off in the background there. Seems like little old me forgot to put it on silent. Apologies for that. So they are not outright saying that uh, loot boxes are 100% gambling but they're definitely saying there's something that should be looked into here and that regulations should be put into place. Which, to be honest, is m most of what most people are asking for. You know, I'm not asking for loot boxes to be banned. I personally find them distasteful. And even cosmetic loot boxes and a full price game is a bad taste in my mouth. Just because, again, if you want to have microtransactions in your game, I kind of hate that as well. But I would still prefer the option to just buy a skin or whatever it happens to be outright rather than having to basically roll the dice. And I've said numerous times, so many times, why I believe loot boxes are gambling, and it's pretty much what they've said, you know, it hits that same spot in your brain, and the fact that there's no monetary value does not change that fact, you know, I could spend a quid on the fruit machines that have like a £5 payout and win 50p. The fact that 50p is like not really worth much of anything except to buy some penny sweets is irrelevant. Even if I don't win anything, it's still got all the bright flashing lights and all the psychological stuff going on as well. So let's see what the response is to this. It probably won't be for quite some time, given how things currently are in the political climate in the UK. Not getting political, but, you know, th things are a little bit dishevelled right now. I think that's fair to say. Anyway, that is me done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. As always, your support is highly appreciated. Do, do remember to like and subscribe. As always, your support is highly appreciated. And again, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.